Buffett. Uh, my name is Hutch Vernon. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I know that you read lots and lots of annual reports, and uh, I'm curious what you are reading for, if you would share that with us. But I'm more curious, because I think I know what you're reading for, uh, if there are any disclosures, uh, any further disclosures that you would like to see companies make in their financial reporting or that the SEC require in uh, financial reporting or proxies or other communications with mm -hmm. their shareholders. And that would be for both uh, you and for Mr. Munger. Yeah, the main thing uh, that they can't mandate in annual reports, I really like to have, I, I like to know as much as I can about the person that's running it and how they think about the business and what's really going on in the business. In other words, I, I would like to have uh, a report that would be identical uh, to what if I owned half of a company but was away for a year and I had a partner who owned the other half, what, when I came back that he would tell me about what had taken place during the past year and what he foresaw coming up and all of that. I, I, that is what I think the purpose of the report is. Now the SEC mandates a lot of information and, and, and some of that is, is helpful. Uh, uh, but there's an intent behind the report. I mean, if it's a sales document, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm less interested. I'm, uh, and uh, I don't see any way to mandate uh, what I'm talking about. But that's the kind of report I'm looking for. What I'm trying to do as I read reports, A, I, I like to understand just generally what's going on in all kinds of businesses. If we own stock in in a company in an industry and there are eight other companies that are in the same industry I, I want to own or be on the mailing list for the reports for the other eight because I can't understand how my company is doing unless I understand what the other eight are doing I, I, I want to have the perspective of in terms of market share or what's going on in the business or their margins or the trend of margins or all kinds of things that I can't get unless I know I can't be an intelligent owner of a business unless I know what all the other businesses in that in that industry are doing and so I try to get that information out of a report if I'm thinking about investing in a specific company I try to size up their business and the people that that, that are that are that are running it and over the years I uh, I, I found uh, reading a lot of reports to be quite useful in terms of making business decisions at, at Berkshire if we own a whole of a business I want to own shares in, in, in all of the competitors just to keep keep track of what's going on and I want to be able to intelligently evaluate how our managers are doing that and I can't do that unless I know the industry backdrop against uh, against which they're working uh, uh, it's amazing uh, you know what how well you can do in, in, in invest in investing really with what I would call outside information I find inside information I'm not sure how useful that is but but outside information uh, there's all kinds of information around as to as to businesses and you don't have to you don't have to understand all of them and you just have to understand the ones that you're thinking about getting in and, and you can do it if you just but you nobody will do it for you you can't read in my view, you can't read Wall Street reports and get anything out of them. You have to do it yourself and, and, and uh, get your arms around it. I, I, I don't think we've ever gotten an idea, you know, in 40 years from a, from a Wall Street report, but, but we've gotten a lot of ideas from annual reports. Charlie? What I find is that it takes a long time to read the annual report, even if it's a comparatively simple business. As if you really are trying to understand it, it's not a bit easy. Yeah, I would say that on average in a business we're really interested in, even though we know what to skip to some extent what to read, I mean, it, it's going to be f 45 minutes or an hour on a report, and if there are six or eight companies in the industry, that's going to be six or eight hours perhaps, and, and then there are quarterlies and a lot of other. I mean, it, the way you learn about businesses is by absorbing information about them, thinking it, deciding what counts and what doesn't count, relating one thing to another, and... Uh, you know that's that's the job, at, uh, uh, and you can't get that by looking at a bunch of little numbers on a chart bobbing up and down about a you know or 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 reading uh, you know market commentary and periodicals or anything of the sort. That just won't do it. it uh, you've got to understand the businesses. That's where it all begins and ends. But I was reading recently uh, in Fortune magazine that when you invested five hundred million dollars in PetroChina back in two thousand one or two thousand two. Uh, all you did was read the annual report. 
I was thinking that most professional investors with the kind of resources that you have would have liked to have done a lot more research and talk to management, maybe regulators, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the question I have is how, you know, what is it that you look for when you're reading an annual report like that? How is it that you were able to and did make an investment purely on the back of reading that report? Yeah, well it was in 2002 and 2003 and the report came out in the spring and I read it and that's the only thing I ever did. I never contacted any management, I never got a brokerage report, I never asked for anybody's opinion. But what I did do was I came to the conclusion that the company and it's not hard to understand crude oil production and refining and marketing and the chemical operation they have. I mean, you can do the same thing with Exxon or BP or any of them, and I do that with all, I look at them. And I came to the conclusion it was worth 100 billion, and then I checked the price and it was selling for 35 billion, roughly. Uh, what's the sense of talking to management? I mean, basically, if you talk to management, almost every company, they'll say they think their stock's a wonderful buy and they'll give you all the the good stuff and skip over things that, it, it just doesn't make any difference. Now if I thought the company was worth 40 billion and had been selling for 35 billion, you know, then at that point you have to start trying to refine your analysis more, but there's no reason to refine your analysis. I mean, I didn't need to know whether it was worth 97 billion or 103 billion if I was buying it at 35 billion. So any further refining of analysis would be a waste of time when what I should be doing is buying the stock. Uh, so, we really like things that you don't have to carry out to three decimal places, you know, Charlie? Yeah, I would argue that we have lower due diligence expenses than anybody else in America, <laughs> and that we have had less trouble because we had less expense. I know of an investment operation in America that pays over $200 billion a year to its... 200 million. 200 million. Yes, yeah. 200 million, pardon me, uh, to every year to its accountants, a lot to help them with due diligence. And I think our operation is safer because we think like engineers. We want these margins of reliability, and, and they're trying to do something really difficult, which is to have fine-grained judgments in very complex areas. and and rely on other people to do it who are getting paid fees. It's a very dicey process to do that. I think it's much safer to do our way. Do you think the auditors know more about making an acquisition you do? You know, you ought to take up auditing and let them run the business as far as we're concerned. <laughs> and we, we are not, I mean, when, when we get a call on something like the Mars Wrigley situation, if we don't know enough about Mars and Wrigley by this point, so that we have to go out. I still like to go out, and, of course, and s sample all the bars. So we have a 15 or, I mean, I feel I owe that to the Berkshire shareholders. But, but I'm not going to look at their labor contracts or their leases or anything like that. It, 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 if, if the value of, of Wrigley depends on a specific lease someplace or a specific commitment to this or that, you know, or a given environmental problem, forget it. You know, it, the, it, it, there, there are these overriding considerations that are enormously important, and then there's a whole lot of trivia that doesn't mean anything. That we have never made a, we've made plenty of big investment, I've made plenty of big investment mistakes. I've never made one, in my view, that would have been uh, avoided by conventional due diligence. And we would have spent a lot of money and we would have wasted a lot of time, and in some cases we would have missed deals simply because we wouldn't have committed fast enough. We have, a, we, have a, we have a significant advantage, and it gets bigger as we get bigger, because in, in terms of big deals, people rely more and more often on process, in that when people want to get a deal done, and they want to know it's going to be done, uh, they, they will come to us. I mean, the Mars people wanted to deal, in terms of this financing aspect of the Wrigley situation, they, they only wanted to deal with Berkshire. And, and because they knew we didn't have any lawyers involved. Uh, I'll admit to this group, we didn't even have any directors involved. We, uh, we just, you know, we got a call, it made sense, and we said yes. And when we say yes, we don't say yes with a material adverse change clause. We don't say yes if financing is available. We just say yes. So I can tell people 
when we make a deal that if we're going to have six and a half billion available, it's going to be available, you know, whether there's a nuclear bomb goes off in New York City or whether there's a flu epidemic or whether Ben Bernanke runs off to South America with Paris Hilton, that, you know, the, um, <laughs> the, the check is going to clear. And if, if you're making a deal, um, you know, the guy that wants the six and a half billion, that assurance is worth something. And, and you really can't get any place. So you say, well, I'll do it, but I've got to have my, my I have a due diligence team check this out and do all of that. So it's a real advantage to us, and I don't think there's any disadvantage to us.